Great, let's get started. Uh, to start us off, could you tell me a little bit about your clinical expertise and training and what kind of work you do? Yeah, so I've been a licensed clinical social worker for, oh, 20, hmm, 20 years, <laughs> depending on what state. Um, and I am currently doing private practice and I also work part-time in a primary care facility, a uh, primary care clinic with doctors. So in that capacity, I am an integrated behavioral health clinician where I see people for shorter um, duration. So it's not an hour long appointments, it's 30 minutes. Uh, private practice is your general you know, therapy sessions of 50, 55 minutes. Um, and my training is from, so I went to University of Hawaii uh, for my undergrad, bachelor's degree, and then master's degree also in social work. Um, and then um, did uh, George Fox for integrated behavioral health. And then also just, you know, it's required for us to take classes and get our um, credits, education credits every other year, or every year, depending on the licensure. Um, so I've taken classes on like definitely CBT act. I'm going to do a somatic one soon. I've been interested in somatic work um, and just different modalities. I also work with the VA population. So that's my other interest. And my passion is working with people of color. That makes a lot of sense. That's awesome to hear and work with. Uh, and how does your approach vary depending on the needs of your clients? The approach, um, depending on the needs of the client, it, so some are more, um, it's really interesting. Some are more, um, they like structure and concrete, uh, tools to use. And some just want to sort of process what's been going on over the last couple of weeks or a few months or so. Um, it kind of depends. It is sort of client-centered or patient-centered um, therapy. Um, and it might take like one or two sessions in the beginning to see, to kind of feel them out and what would be helpful and then checking in um, with them to see if this is what they're hoping for. Is it helping? Are they hoping for something different? Um, so it kind of just depends. I I I focus on um, like so people of color. Most of my clients, like in private practice, like ninety percent of them um, are of Asian descent. Um, so that's geared a lot towards like communication and boundaries and expressing feelings. Um, and then other populations, it would be. Um, like sort of neuroscience informed therapy um, and self-compassion. So it kind of just depends on you know, the picture, what, what it looks like and what they're hoping for in terms of their goals. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, part of the work we do at Asian Mental Health Collective is just generally trying to break down barriers to accessing mental health resources. And of course, a big barrier is the stigma surrounding needing mental health help, which is especially prevalent in Asian populations. So I was wondering if you could share why you think your work and therapy overall is important. Yeah, I recently started a group for Asian American, for Asian, well, it's AAPI. So not just Asian, but also Pacific Islanders uh, for women. Um, I was noticing that a lot of times I am their first experience for therapy and they might be in their 30s or 40s or yeah, 30s and 40s is mostly who I see. And it's like their first time. And and I kind of wish, you know, I, I kind of wish I had therapy when I was younger, um, but it was it felt inaccessible or nobody was talking about therapy. My parents weren't talking about therapy. My friends weren't. They were all Asian also growing up in Hawaii. Um, and so I thought it, if people aren't accessing it individually maybe we could like start a group <laughs> like have a group because we a lot of cultures we learn in families we learn in um, group situations so um so I started a women's group and then I'm also starting to and the women's group is a workshop that happens once a week and then once a month after that but I also I am starting to work at a community um and it is Bayani Han um 
Filipino Community Center in Portland. So I'll be working with the youth there in groups. So I am really interested in um, helping people um, get mental health like education, but it might look different. It might not be one-on-one -on -one for everyone. They might feel more comfortable in a group to feel like validation, um, friendships. There's a little bit of social, you know, aspect to the group. And so it's just a different way. So not everybody wants to do individual therapy. So I'm just offering something different. That makes a lot of sense. Um, are what are, is that one of the main is that one of the main barriers, or have you faced any other barriers that your clients have shared amongst AIP AAPI communities in seeking help? Yeah, well, finances for sure, um, and sometimes the insurance, um, co the co or the co payment might be high, or the co insurance might be high. Um, so they might see me for a little while and then have to take a break. And then, then I might see them again after six months. Um, some people are changing jobs. Um, so they lose the insurance and I'm not paneled with every insurance in the state. Um, it's just, our system is set up that way. It's, it's unfortunate, um, that, that when you change jobs, you get another insurance, you can't keep the same providers, um, uh, medical or mental health providers. Um, other barriers, time. Some people are very, very busy. Um, and then also the stigma of accessing help or seeking help. Um, sometimes it's easier to uh, start with your primary care physician because a lot of times there's someone like me in a primary care office. Um, so that can sort of ease the burden of like looking for a mental health person or like at least dipping your toe into the water of like, what is a mental health person like? Um, so there's, you know, that sort of some ways to um, overcome um, sort of the stigma. If you think of it more as like mental health is, is affects physical health and physical health affects mental health. So we might as well like offer everything <laughs> in one setting. Asian Mental Health Collective. It's a directory. Have you heard of that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I so I've used it a lot. Because I'm I'm full, right? Right. I'm at capacity. I can only take people for like the groups. Um so when people call me or when other therapists call me, um, I'm usually recommending that source. Um, let me think if there's any others. Well, for myself, for therapists who are of Filipino descent, there is like a, a group for us to meet once a month. So I'm part of that. Um, but for clients, there are, um, there's a lot of um, Instagram accounts that I follow these days that are geared towards Asian population, which I'm so happy for because it's like, they're talking about things that like I, sh I, I wish I heard when I was younger. And so Instagram accounts <laughs> have been really like normalizing the stuff that um, we grew up with right, about like parents who might be controlling, um, the pressure of going to college, not having relationships too soon, um, and just sort of the, some of the inflexibility that we were grow we grew up with and the, um, just the collectivism sometimes, you know, I know we, it's both is good, right? Individualism and collectivism is good, but having a strong collectivism sometimes can harm us. Um, so I, yeah, I follow a bunch of Instagram accounts and uh, look into their websites. Um, and I also use Facebook for, um, to connect with other therapists who are um, working with the same populations. That makes sense. I, I totally agree on Instagram too. I think I've found that there's a lot of experiences 
me and my peers have all experienced growing up that none of us really knew how to articulate or we didn't even really know other people were experiencing it. And then as we've gotten older, we've started to see conversation about it. And then we've started to realize, oh, these are things that happen a lot amongst especially like AAPI communities or in other places. And then we're starting to like find resources to work through things. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. What's happening here in Portland too. There's more um there are more events that are AAPI related or API related. And so like I did a bike ride <laughs> and there was a API market that happened two days ago. And it's just, and all these restaurants are doing events also. It's just, um, it's, it's good to see representation. Yeah, definitely. I feel like things like that raise a lot of awareness too, I'm sure amongst people who maybe don't know a lot about it. But yeah, well, have you, uh, on that note, have you had any experiences yourself with therapy as a mental health professional and what have been some of the takeaways from your experiences that stuck with you? Oh, as a mental health professional? Yeah, like experiences you've had with therapy yourself or just in general. Oh, yeah. Experiences oh, gosh. You. Yeah. So uh, personally, I've had like three therapists myself. The first two uh, were people who were white. Um, and then I had a Filipino therapist for the first time ever I had an Asian therapist uh which is so cool uh like there's this sort of shorthand um where there was an immediate like understanding of the pressures and the whole family concept and uh, uh the concept of um shame <laughs> shame comes up a lot um in you know in, in therapy a lot of times shame boundaries um and perfectionism um perfectionism is, perfectionism is also a, a common theme that comes up often I fe felt a lot more comfortable I think I felt comfortable in my other with my other therapists also but um uh, the Filipino therapist I think there was a it just felt different. Like there's, there was a deeper understanding, I think. Yeah. What is some advice that you have for someone who's wanting to explore their mental health in general, whether it be learning about topics, going to therapy or pursuing a career in the field? Yeah. Oh, well, let's see if they're interested in improving their own mental health. Um, I know it's hard sometimes to look for a therapist because there might be long waiting lists. Um, I also use psychology today because you could also filter. Have you heard of that one? I have, yeah. Yeah, psychologytoday.com. You could filter by ethnicity or language uh, and gender and uh, what you would like to focus on. So I use that. Um, and it's, it has a nice feature because it says who has a waiting list and who has availability and not. So that's um, that's a nice way to do it. And I would recommend um, if there's a way to email them, I would do that instead of calling because a lot of therapists, um, they're not picking up their phone. You know, it just goes to voicemail. And so like, cutting and pasting the same sort of email message to them can save a lot of time. So I've done that. Uh, I've done that on behalf of clients and patients. Um, and then going to your doctor, because a lot of times large medical system, systems have a behavioral clinician or a mental health clinician um, on staff. There's um, like, I've worked in small clinics where there were just five people and I was the only mental health person. Um, currently, I work in a larger clinic with seven doctors and there's two of us there. Um, so that's another way people could access services. Or um, there's a lot of groups that are online too. Um, I want to say Mango. I don't really know the full like name of the comp name of the business. Mango counseling or something like that. They do free like I've seen them on um, Instagram and on all their on their website. Like they're offering free like sessions online. So even like dipping your toe in the, you know, those spaces um, can be helpful just so that it opens up a window of like opportunity and possibility. Yeah, a lot of times I start with, um, or I encourage people to have uh, learned some self-compassion practices because 
it's hard to do things without being kind to ourselves, and especially for starting a new journey. I think it's helpful to be to be kind to ourselves um, when we're doing hard things, and to also feel proud that we're doing brave things, right? Doing things out of our comfort zone. So I think I would focus on self compassion, but also books like even going to the uh, library or a bookstore and just perusing the the shelves of self help books, and then just kind of like seeing which one jumps out, or even on you know um searching like amazon or other book stores about um what would be helpful for certain topics like anxiety and just kind of see what jumps out the ones that i am attracted to are um things about from things from brene brown rick hansen dan siegel um so there's a few that i tend to um gravitate towards um and then also um what's another one I like the neuroscience aspect because and I like talking about the brain a lot because it helps normalize what's happening and why we do the things we do why we think the, the way we think so I like going towards the whole like brain thing like don't worry about it it's not it's not a character flaw <laughs> like, <laughs> have self-compassion and it's what you're feeling what you're doing it's not a character flaw we are wired for certain things and so like it kind of helps people understand it it's not their fault it could be generational trauma it could be how they um were treated as a child how they might not have felt comforted when they were stressed um and so i i do a lot of right i hope people find that they can have self-compassion and also know it's not their fault that that's that's really important to hear, and I actually will probably go make check out some of those book recommendations myself. Yes, when do we apply self compassion? And one of the group members she said, when it gets to be so stressful, and then I thought, well, we don't really have to wait till it's that bad. <laughs> like we should apply self compassion when we notice there's like an emotional hurt or when there was a, there was a sting that you, you know, you like an, from an interaction from someone or when there was bad news um, or when things didn't meet your expectations, basically. We don't have to wait until we are in tears or like um, overeating, over drinking, whatever, you know, we could apply self-compassion sooner. Um, the practices, I learned a bunch of practices from a website, and she. this is a self-compassion researcher. Her name is Kristen Neff. And basically, the one that I usually go to to teach and to do myself is the one where you put two hands on the heart, you take a breath, and you pick three feelings that you want to cultivate or feel or, or instill and absorb in your in your brain and body. In your nervous system so you know and this is not just me touching my chest this is can my chest feel the warm kind touch of my hands right and then saying you know picking your three birds may i feel safe and then you breathe again may i feel calm and may i feel love and kind of ground yourself to the floor be present so I teach that, but then also the quick one, <laughs> there's, there's, Kristen Neff has a whole list of things. You can go to her website. She has a whole bunch of practices and videos and things like that. The other one is, um, it's just a question. In this moment, how can I be kind to myself? And it could be as simple as like holding a warm mug of something. It could be walking barefoot in the grass. It could be getting my, my blanket and just cozying it up. It could be getting um, some coffee with a friend, but, or just make an appointment to go see somebody after work or whatever. But in this moment, how can I be kind to myself? It's kind of like, it helps not just put your brain on the problems that are going on but like this is a good problem to solve how can I be kind with myself you're offering your brain a really good problem to like think about instead of trying to like problem solve everything else in the world or all the tasks that have to be done you're like no no, no this is a good problem for me to solve how can I be kind to myself 
I think that makes a lot of sense. That's what I do a lot of the times too. And I find it to be very helpful. And it's nice to hear someone else also talk about that. Um, it's another a good practice, isn't it? I think, I think so. I think it's a great way to just like step back, think, and then take care of yourself. Because sometimes when you're in those moments and you're feeling like particularly anxious, like it's your mind will not want to like move on from thinking about whatever is going on. So it's a great. Or way. when you're thinking about other people <laughs> so much too. I like what you said, you take a step back and like, oh wait, what do I need? <laughs> what do I yeah. need? <laughs> exactly. And sometimes you're, you like your body's like, oh, I just want like, I want some, a warm beverage, like you said, or maybe you want to go on a walk or a jog or something. And that gets in your mind to do focus on other things too. And it's great. Uh, that brings up another question in my mind, which is um, also kind of related to young people, but I would say generally, um, I've noticed that there's been more discovery of how physical health and mental health are related. Um, and I think there's been a lot of discussion recently surrounding, especially like food and sleep and things and how that affects other, how effect, how that affects your mental health and vice versa. So I was wondering if you, like what your thoughts were on that and if you had had any experiences related to that, that you wanted to talk about. Yeah. So I work in primary care. So this comes up a lot. <laughs> like Sometimes um, I get a referral or a warm handoff from a doctor or medical provider uh, because of sleep issues. Um, and then so, and sleep with poor sleep that affects like mood. <laughs> it affects hormones. It affects overeating. It affects um, energy. It affects concentration. Right. So definitely we have to address sleep and regulate our sleep for sure. The other thing I talk to talk about a lot in primary care is food. Um, so we talk about prebiotic. So we have to take care of our gut, our gut health. Right. Um, because that's where uh, other neurotransmitters, serotonin is created. I think it's serotonin in the gut, not just, you know, the brain. So it's like the gut is the stomach is a second brain. So we have to take care of our, our stomach or gut. And um, because that affects mood. <laughs> and the other thing I talk about uh, in addition to prebiotics is and sleep is um, amino acids. Mm -hmm. So of getting protein. And there's an, there's like an equation about how much protein you should get per, you know, per body size or weight. Uh, I try to aim for like for personally, I try to aim for 100 <laughs> grams of protein. So like 30, you know, a meal, which is hard. So, and I supplement that with amino acids. So amino acids are from, is what you get from having protein. And that is the building blocks for everything, for neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters. Um, some feel good chemicals are neurotransmitters. And so the only way we get these neurotransmitters is if we have the amino acids or the building blocks to make them. <laughs> Antidepressants do not um, give you the neurotransmitters. <laughs> you have to have it in your system first. So, um, so what we eat is important. Uh, but uh, physical movement, because it doesn't really have to be like going to the gym. Not everybody has to go to the gym. Not everybody has to run a marathon. Like, <laughs> um, and and exercise should not be really tied to like weight loss. <laughs> Yeah. Right. We should exercise to feel better, right? We should exercise for energy to keep our mind going. We should exercise for neurogenesis so we can grow new brain cells. You know, we exercise for so many reasons. It is not <laughs> like should should not be focused on weight loss, but strengthening mobility and lifelong like fitness or just being able to do what you want to do for the, you know, for as long as you can, basically. Yeah. And our bodies were supposed to move. We're supposed to have variability. We're supposed to have emotional variability and feel different emotions, you know, comfortable and uncomfortable. We're supposed to have like body variability, heart rate variability. We're built for that. Let's just do it. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, um, that is all the questions I have for you today. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with me and for being so open about everything. Yeah. Thanks, Irina. Thanks for, Thank you. for asking me the questions. It's great.